Hello, good morning, and welcome to another installment of Profiles in Tacticalness. So today, we will be talking about everyone's favorite and or completely ignored healer class, uh, the Cleric, aka the Monk, aka the Healer, uh, aka the Shaman in one case. Uh, it kind of depended which game you were actually playing. But alright, let's get into this thing. So first of all, uh, you may notice, visually, they're one of the classes that's actually stayed relatively almost consistent throughout the entire series. So, you know, good on them for that. I think the uh, Rune Fencer slash Valkyrie slash uh, Spellblade is probably the next runner-up on that. Before you mention the Knight, that guy's actually gone through quite a fair bit of armor redesigns. But uh, speaking of their looks, if you look on the, on the left uh, for the March of the Black Queen uh, battle sprite there, that right there is a, is a funny reference that actually came up in the PSP remake, believe it or not. Uh, not specifically that one. Actually, the, the one that got referenced is one that I couldn't find a picture of for whatever reason. So here's an interesting note. When March of the Black Queen got remade as Ogre Battle Limited Edition for the PS1, uh, they decided to westernize the Cleric. Uh, there weren't very many visual changes that they did, but for the Cleric, they decided to replace their traditional Ankh and or just regular staff uh, with a crucifix. Uh, so, overall, they still did the same stuff, you know, for their frontline attack, they still shot out that weird sort of staff laser for the backline, they still did the regular healing, but yeah, they decided to give them that crucifix instead. Now, what's funny is uh, when I was actually trying out uh, a limited edition for the first time myself, I thought there were no differences. So when I first saw this sprite, uh, my, the first thing that came to mind was those statues in the Palace of the Dead in... Um, uh, the PSP remake of Let Us Cling Together. And uh, it, you may notice they're carrying a staff, they have a, they have a slightly different hat. And so, you know, I looked at that and I thought, oh wow, I never caught this reference the first time around. You know, I never played Ogre Battle up to that point. And I was very surprised. And then as soon as I went uh, trying to ask if anybody else noticed this, I was greeted with a response of, what are you talking about? They're not the same one. And that's when I noticed they actually used a different sprite in both versions. So yes, the limited, version, limited edition version got referenced. For some reason, the original didn't. Who knows? But uh, they decided to westernize it. That's why they have that crucifix. Now, let's get on to how the class itself actually functions. So starting off early on here, let's go ahead and uh, pull up some of this March of the Black Queen action. So over here... Uh, their, their role was relatively simple. Uh, essentially, they are just somebody that heals from the back row. They're able to shoot a sort of staff laser from the front row. And uh, this is a little excerpt from the uh, uh, from the fairy run here. So as you can see, they're just going to go ahead and run through all their attacks. Uh, this is actually the upgraded version, uh, the Shaman. Uh, the main difference between them, the uh, original healer only gets access to a single heal, whereas the... Uh, upgraded version, aka the Shaman, in this case, ends up getting a Heal All ability, which will be Heal Plus. Uh, they'll actually just learn that spell naturally over time. So, only female units could become healers in this version, but uh, as you can see here, uh, they do a pretty good job of keeping everybody alive. They're also one of the very few classes that has a Holy ability on them. So, for example, if you have them set to an AI that says to target the weakest units, uh, instead of healing their own guys, they will uh, use an exorcism on the opposite uh, on the opposite side, and that will essentially allow them to do a big AOE that will eliminate all zombies just completely at that point. So we can go ahead and uh, put away March of the Black Queen here for a moment. Now, that exorcism ability made them absolutely indispensable early on and especially going into the mid game uh, later on you did get more units that were able to do exorcisms actually that's this is going to be a running theme in almost all of the games where early on their exorcism is absolutely indispensable and then later on other units are just able to do their job a little bit better uh, minus the healing part we'll cover that when we get to it so march of the black queen ob64 that's their role you know they they're the backline healer frontline very iffy attacker and then um uh, from the uh, from their targeting, well, how would I even put this? If you assign them to attack weak units, then they're able to do an exorcism. So things change a little bit uh, once we get to the SNES game, the first SNES game, I should say. Actually, the second one. What am I saying there? Uh, once we get to Let Us Cling Together. So uh, with Let Us Cling Together, uh, suddenly uh, the shift actually went from female healers before it was the female units that got to be healers and shamans and 
got all of their upgrades. But once we get to uh, to let us cling together, they decided no. Both guys can be healers, however, only the melee units are able to upgrade into priests. So the main reason that you would want to go get a priest is they're able to do resurrection. Otherwise, your healers are pretty much basic healers, you know, exactly as you'd expect there. Uh, the only exception was, I believe, Olivia could become one, or, and I believe Aurelius could become one. I could be wrong in that. However, um, yes, it, it was mostly a... Uh, it was mostly male classes that you wanted to have as healers in that one. Uh, early on, exorcism was absolutely essential, and at that point they were still uh, still operating under the assumption that if there's a zombie, whatever health they're at, exorcism will just completely annihilate them. I should probably have mentioned this for March of the Black Queen and OB64 as well, but basically if any holy ability hits any undead in any of the first three games, they're just instantly vaporized and that's it. So, you know, all good. It's all well and good there. They're pretty handy to have around. Uh, their stat gains aren't fantastic, but overall, you know, they're they're a very useful, relatively boring, but very useful class to have around. So next we move on to Knight of Lotus. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing in this case too. Uh, they don't get any offensive abilities. They're just there with uh, with their healing abilities. Uh, they're able to uh, get resurrect once they get uh, promoted into a priest. Uh, interestingly, this time the priest was actually unisex, so either one of your classes would be able to do it. However, they had to do a lot of healing in order to be able to even unlock the class. And uh, yeah, they became iffy to look at suddenly <laughs> especially the male sprite was uh, was very strange because suddenly he put on about 50 years over the course of those few weeks where he was training up to be a good priest but uh, anyhow uh they're you know they're very good still your premier healer unit still going to be someone that you're probably going to be using all game uh and especially since this was the first two tactics ogres games uh, you could basically you know pack on some heavy armor on them uh, maybe even give them a bow uh, and uh, all of their healing scaled up. It was useful all game, very practical. You know, nothing really negative to say there. Now we get to the PSP remake of Lucked, and oh no. <laughs> it hurt. It really hurt what happened to these guys. So first off, they became really stylish. Like, they got super stylish with their, with their hats and everything. Um, but yeah, so... You may recall them as that class that was, you know, kind of okay early on, and then you just completely forgot about by the end of the game. And here's the many reasons why. So first of all, they took away scaling from healing at this point. Uh, basically, healing used to scale up with intelligence. Uh, in this case, it uh, was just a flat amount all game. Uh, it had a very minuscule amount of scaling, allegedly, but it only ever went up by about 5 to 10 points, give or take. Uh, so early on when your characters are running around with 100 health, 40 is going to matter, 80 is going to matter, and uh, 160 is going to matter, because those were their healing increments. Uh, but then once you got into uh, into late game, uh, once your characters are running around with, you know, 300-400 health, those amounts don't really matter that much anymore, and at that point, items are very far outclassing anything healers can really do without using their special abilities. So now as far as abilities go, uh, they were given Mother's Mercy, Mother's Blessing, as well as... Uh, well, let's discuss Mother's Mercy and Mother's Blessing first of all. So, both of these were very confusing. I'm sure many people have run into the, uh, the issue of accidentally using Mother's Mercy on themselves when they intended to use Blessing. It's confusing why they gave them those names, but those are their two main abilities. Um, I mean, Saris Pact and Recruit... I mean, a lot of classes get those, it's nothing terribly special. So, Mother's Blessing allows them to double the effectiveness of whatever healing spell they're using, and then Mother's Mercy is the one that removes all debuffs from any particular unit that you aim it at. Now, here is the thing. Um, they weren't exactly the fastest class in the world, so Mother's Mercy was very useful to have. It allowed them to go throw out a heal, while also allowing them to take care of a lot of debuffs at once. Um, and again, it removed all debuffs at one time, so once you got into late game, that was kind of the one thing that you could say that they were actually useful for. Because you had units, for example, that would get like charmed, bewitched, poisoned, stunned, whatever, in one turn. And if you wanted to go deal with all that, you know, you had Mother's Mercy as an ability. So that is incredibly useful. However, because their healing didn't scale, it they pretty much needed to use Mother's Blessing in order to be able to even keep up. 
and uh, honestly, just giving them a lobber and having them throw items was a bit more effective than trying to manage the amount of MP and time that it actually took to get that whole healing setup together. On top of that, they were extraordinarily flimsy. And on top of that, uh, their exorcism ability is pretty much obsolete from the very start of the game, unfortunately. So at this point, you have to actually knock out a zombie or a skeleton in order to be able to kill it. And uh, you're better off just, with how little you actually run into those units, you're better off just going and buying the spellbook for exorcism and, you know, using those exorcisms uh, right as, a, as an ability for anyone. So, for example, you've got your knight in the front row that managed to get a counter hit and knock out a skeleton. You can just have him exercise the guy on the spot instead of waiting for a priest to come up, you know, seeing that priest getting getting uh, taken out by arrows on his way over, and then realizing, hey, I could have just used this book the whole time, who needs this priest? So, you know, they had a lot of stuff going against them. Uh, on top of that, uh, once you got into late game, they became even more obsolete, because you could just go and buy Banish instead of Exorcisms. Uh, not to mention, all of their heal abilities uh, were, again, buyable as items, so essentially anybody could go and use them at any time. Uh, including their area heals. Uh, the area heals were unique to them, but uh, again, anybody could actually still use them as an item. They were cheap enough that uh, for for how little you would need to use those things, it was usually better off just going to the store, spending the money to have the items, and then using those uh, class slots for somebody that's actually carrying their weight. Uh, Offense-wise, obviously you wouldn't expect very much from a healer. Uh, they could actually do some pretty respectable damage, but it took a very long time to set up. So here's the, the the setup in question. What you would need to do is you would need to have them uh, go with a couple uh, rune fencers, uh, take them out to a field, like let's say Tynemouth there, uh, trap an enemy healer in a little bubble of, uh, of barricades, uh, then essentially make sure that your healer, uh, or rather your healer on the inside has no magic ability, but then you have a second healer on the outside that does, you know, or you could just have your rune fencers uh, with uh, with the healing abilities in this case. You know, just make them feel bad about it right from the get-go. And uh, yeah, you would just kind of leave them in that barricade. Uh, they would run up and hit the other guy who would continuously heal themselves. You would continue doing this ad nauseum for hours on end until finally they ended up ranking up their cudgel skill. And once they did that, uh, they had a few um, a few moves on their kill move list that would be able to scale with uh, uh, their augment light ability as well as their cudgel ability. And uh, in those cases, they'd be able to do some pretty okay damage. Uh, especially the multi-hit ones were relatively okay. But because they didn't get very good stats unless you were using denim in this way, odds are it would still be kind of mediocre. Uh, you weren't exactly going into winning any fights outright using only those abilities. So they were very, very, very disappointing in the remake. I was, there was very little reason to use them, and it's a little bit sad when that's even mentioned in the wiki, when they basically just mention, you know, around halfway through the game, that they're, they're just entirely obsolete, obsolete in every way, shape, and form. So now you might be saying, well, yes, then there's one vision. And yes, you'd be exactly right, because uh, yes, in one vision, they became amazing. Actually, in one vision, it's arguable that they became the go-to need to have it kind of class actually oops i accidentally had my uh, window here there we go now what do you see about this monk uh, as you see uh, for uh, the female units they're actually renamed to monks uh, that's because they are uh, kind of an amalgamation of a few different tropes here so we've got the monk trope you know we've got the kind of traveling healer trope and we've also got a few abilities brought in from the old priest because uh, there's no promotion available for clerics in um uh, over here in uh, Let Us Cling Together Remake. So, all right, let's take a look at this here. So first off, equipment-wise, as you can see, they get access to fist weapons. Now you might be saying to yourself, okay, but they don't exactly have the punching stats. Like, oh, over on the right, you can see, you know, their dex and strength, compared to everything else, they're a little bit on the low side. So well, why would that matter? Why that matters is right here. You see this, uh, this poison debuff? Yeah. So if we take a look at their skills right here, uh, bear in mind, all standard fist weapons have that uh, have that poison effect on them. So if we go down here, uh, we see counter hit. And what you want to do, as backwards as this may seem, you can put your healers right on the front line. And they're able to heal themselves very effectively. They're able to heal others very effectively. And they're able to do that job a lot better if they're not moving anywhere. 
So you may be saying, okay, you know, so they're able to poison and they're able to poison on a counter attack. You know, that's fine, but aren't they a healer? Aren't they flimsy? Well, as you can see, they gain access to uh, to light armors. They actually gain access to helmets as well. So uh, looking at the different, uh, have a few different setups that uh, that we can go with here. This is my one of my personal favorites. Uh, normally what I would do is actually do a fist weapon, a damage reflecting shield, a uh, vest armor, and a helmet. Uh, you can potentially do... Uh, do uh, heavy, or rather, uh, heavy leg armor, um, a helmet, a seal of vigor, for example, and um, and a, a medium shield, and it's just it's really, really, really good. So, okay, looking at their equipment here, as far as uh, shields are concerned, so we're gonna go here. So they get access to all light shields as well as what I like to call the medium shields. Uh, Essentially, ones like this, some of the trickier ones. So, like right here, they're able to do, uh, able to get reflect uh, damage off of this shield. On top of that, they're able to get the reflect damage ability. So, for example, this guy can sit on the front lines. Uh, he's relatively tanky. He can actually hit pretty decently with this hammer. On top of that, he can also stun. This guy can stun on a counter attack. Also handy. So he would be on the front line spreading out stuns. She would be out there spreading out poisons. Uh, they'd be spreading out some extra damage off of these uh, spiked and shard shields, which you get uh, around uh, midpoint around chapter two, I believe. Um, and yeah, both of these allow them to spread around some extra damage from their respective uh, types. So they're able to spread out damage, they're able to spread out debuffs, they're able to heal their own guys, and they've got armors specifically designed to make them able to just withstand at least a round until they're able to come back and heal themselves. Now you might be saying, well, what about those crappy healing abilities? What's changed there? Well, I'm glad you asked, because on top of all this great armor and uh, equipment that they get, uh, they actually scale their healing once again. So we'll uh, we'll show that in the fight in just a little bit here. But they're able to, uh, they actually get a secondary little heal on top of their standard one, uh, which was uh, Rakes' way to work around how the system had worked. It, basically, if it had gone for full intelligence scaling, it would have gone way too high. Uh, but if if it goes like this, where it has a set amount and then it scales a small amount on top of it, it allows it to scale up about the same as it did in previous games. Now, uh, all right, one thing I should mention right here, as far as builds are concerned, now we're going to take a step back to take another look at their equipment here because we'll get to the we'll get to the skills. But uh, look at this. So, I mean, light vest. I mentioned that uh, damage reflecting shield. Uh, this one reflects magic. And her poison fist. Okay, so she's got avoidance, she's got uh, damage output, she's got avoidance. And what's this right here? Well, it reduces, as you can see, this is the side graded uh, mage helmet. Um, this is just a better variant of some of the ones out there. But if you side grade your mage hats, it allows them to basically tank their resistance to the point where they'll end up getting targeted by mages all the time, but they'll end up absorbing uh, MP from it. On top of that, you can sometimes get some racial bonuses, but either way. So their resistance will go down pretty tremendously. Units will constantly target them. They're able to pretty much be flush with MP at all times doing this. You combine it with something like a shard shield and they're essentially doing passive damage as you go on. Uh, give them a seal of vigor. This way they're pretty protected on the physical side and they're reflecting magic. This guy is pretty well protected on the magic side and reflecting physical. Uh, this one over here is just kind of just showing off all the different light equipment. And uh, even with a single seal of evasion, they're able to get avoidance up in uh, the range of 220. So yeah, they can scale up their avoidance pretty high. These uh, Archytros trousers are actually pretty good. Um, because they boost MP, it allows them to regenerate MP that tiny bit faster. Uh, that's one thing that doesn't get mentioned very often, but when you see MP boosts, uh, your MP essentially restores at a certain percentage of your entire bar. So by raising it by 20, it's essentially raising it, I, I believe it's like 4 or more MP recovery per turn or something like that. But uh, at any rate, yeah, we have him with the Light Code here, we have him with the Light Giver. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's see how effective they are, right? So we look at the skills and let's see what's changed here. So first off, they get Consecrate Dead. They, they have a lot, they have a fair few more abilities than they did before. So Recruit and Saris back, those are still there. 
nobody really touched them. So Consecrate, this used to be a Necromancer ability, but it definitely makes a lot more sense uh, when it comes to healers. So they can just pick a zombie or a skeleton and just make them go back to sleep. Uh, make them uh, completely unable to revive. It's got a range in an area of five, so it's got some pretty significant range on it. If you have them in the front line, there's some skeletons. You can't exactly uh, spare the time to go exercise yet. You'll just drop a Consecrate on them, have them do whatever else they need to do, get back to exercising them another time. Mother's Blessing, this is the same as it was, uh, essentially allowing you to go and double the effectiveness of your next healing ability. However, as you can see, it's a little bit faster to use. Uh, Tabula Rasa, uh, over here, this is what used to be Mother's Mercy. Uh, this was changed due to the general confusingness of having two separate moves that started with Mother's. Um, so yeah, instead of uh, Mother's Blessing and Mother's Mercy, it's now Tabula Rasa. Um, essentially, same thing. I believe this has a little bit more range on it, though. Uh, we've got Reflect Damage and Absorb MP on them, a Tactician to be able to use their abilities a bit more. Uh, max TP up, although I personally don't see a whole lot of use for Max TP up unless you're going for a more offensive build with them, uh, with hammers and some such. Um, Field Alchemy 2, uh, so they have access to pretty, pretty much every item as well. Actually, not pretty much every item, literally every item. Sanctuary 1 and 2, in case you want to stop some zombies from getting close. I only have these on Donalto at the moment, uh, due to the fact that he's able to... Uh, he's the only one that doesn't really have a good uh, good frontlining setup. Um, normally, the way, um, the way that this goes, they have... You're going to want to have a lot of other abilities, since their main abilities are basically going to take three slots now. You don't need to, to go and pile up your entire skill bar in order to even use them. So Clarity 4 over here uh, just raises MP restoration. Um, I like to have that on Oleus here, despite the fact that she's essentially absorbing MP all the time anyway. Uh, just kind of have her for going and dumping out those expensive abilities. Um, Mother's Blessing, Augment Lights, uh, Counter Hits, and just a pretty good setup there. Um, for Elrig here, I have him with... Um, uh, what's it here? Uh, didn't mean to have... What was it? Didn't mean to have Thetanology on him. I actually meant to have Instill Light on him. So he's going for a more offensive setup. So he's got Tabula Rasa to get rid of debuffs. Clarity for the sake of boosting his MP. Uh, Instill Light, since they're able to get Instill abilities now. Uh, augment Light to improve that even farther. Uh, Mother's Blessing, counter hits, uh, so you get some stuns occasionally, as well as a parry. Uh, you can give them light shields, so if you give them light shields plus uh, helmets, they're able to parry very effectively. In fact, now let's uh, go ahead and show that off right here. So he's getting parry from this helmet. If I were to give him this uh, shield down here, like let's go ahead, go ahead and show this. So if I give him a, like a damask shield, for example, instead of reflecting damage, like he already has reflect damage built in. Um, giving both the Spike Shield and the Innate Ability allows you to reflect 40% damage. In this case, he's going down to 20% Reflection, but he's getting uh, Rank 3 Parry just straight out the gate. Uh, he's never trained Parry before, and he's already up to 3 now. That is something that used to be complete endgame material for the original game. Like, not even endgame, like post-post-game type of stuff to get to the point of getting Innate plus 3 Parry. So right there, you know, you're getting it uh, pretty early on with... Um, Pretty much as soon as you get it, gain access to helmets, actually. So right around Chapter 2. And, uh, yeah. But the last one here, you know, relatively similar setup. Still has all his main abilities. He's gotten, um... I apologize here. We're apparently going through a lot of menus. So he's got Reflect, he's got Augment. You know, the usual kind of things you'd expect. So let's get into the fight here. Uh, this time I actually didn't make an entire party of them. I set them all to AI, and I went ahead and did it this way in order to show just how effective they can be. So it's... Uh, it, anytime that I bring this up, people seem to doubt when I was telling them that uh, Clerics are easily one of the best and most uh, needed classes in the game right now. And uh, again, this is with the One Vision mod. Uh, it's essentially a, 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 I would call it almost like a remaster of a remaster, because for all intents and purposes, it took, uh, it, it took the game as it already was and just made everything as it should, as it logically should have been. So in this case, healers, uh, throughout the entire story, healers are constantly propped up as, you know, like, these guys are amazing, they're these pillars of the community, they're these guys that always hold up armies and everything else, and that's why throughout the series, that was their role. Like, they, they were this guy that 
or a guy or a girl or whatever else that they were relatively unassuming you know they weren't exactly you know hugely powerful or anything but an entire army could you know could go and continue living well past the point that they should be able to just because of this you know one or two units that were in that squad so when they when in the remake they basically just decided to nerf them straight into the ground it was a little bit disappointing and it seems like uh rakes uh, shared that opinion because uh, he you know, essentially made them what I like to consider the lock of many many of the teams. So if you remember, like let's say if you remember March of the Black Queen or you remember Night of Lotus, uh, there were lots of those moments where it's like, okay, you know, that team has a healer. I'm probably not going to be able to make much progress without taking out that healer first. So they're all going around, you know, trying to position their units to go prevent you from running to the healer. You're trying to sneak some guys around to go take them out and everything else. And that they're back to that role now. So you'll find in many cases your your front line will meet their front line, and you're going to have uh, you're going to have your ninjas trying to sneak around to try to stun them or silence them. You're going to have rogues going in trying to assassinate them, that sort of thing. And like you're constantly going to be planning around how to get to go and like get to that healer. Like how do I prevent them from taking their next turn? Because as you'll see here, once these guys start taking damage, like the amount of healing they do is pretty amazing. Um, Actually, this party is uh, a little bit OP at the moment. <laughs> Maybe I should have sent less guys in. But uh, but yeah, once they start taking damage, we'll see. Uh, since again, they can, by and large, for every phase of the game where they have abilities, they're usually going to be able to go and completely heal up any unit that they end up touching. Um, with exception to their area heals, which are usually going to be about 50-75% of the uh, unit's health, it's going to vary, of course, but uh, generally speaking, that's what I always ended up seeing as far as they went. When uh, when they say in the description, you, you should keep one in every party, they now mean it. So like right there, heal 3 does 178, plus it does another 60 to 80 on top of that. That's what that second zero was there. It would have been about a 60 or 80. So if you're talking a... Um, if they used a Mother's Blessing on it, they essentially would have been doing around 340 with another 140 or so on top of that. So it's like it's strong. They're very, very strong. Easily one of those ones that you're going to want to have in your party all game. So they're no longer that sort of joke that you casually threw in the dumpster about halfway through. They're now somebody that's actually worth keeping. And by worth keeping, I mean they're going to be the dang friggin' heroes of your party in a lot of cases. Uh, so it should be reiterated, uh, Rune Fencers and Knights, uh, which used to serve the main frontline healer role from before, uh, that's not the case anymore. And uh, now with uh, One Vision, you're going to have your healers doing the actual healing, whereas uh, Knights, for example, can give regen, uh, Rune Fencers are able to give an accuracy buff. Uh, on top of, of uh, a few other buffs that they ended up getting. So these guys are your dedicated healer. Uh, the only other ones that are actually able to use the healing abilities they do are uh, the Familiar and the Angel Knight. Uh, so both of those are going to be a little bit different to use. On top of that, it should be noted that since uh, books and scrolls and all that are no longer available um, as just items. You actually have to learn the ability in order to use it. Uh, that was one of those things that was used and abused throughout the original to a, a pretty comical extent, quite frankly. And uh, yeah, now at this point, since you do actually have to learn those abilities, they, they're they essential. They're dang near essential. I've done a few runs where I didn't use any healers at all, so it's not to say that you can't make it without them, but they're very, very, very incredibly handy. So, all right, I think I've about covered what I wanted to cover with these guys. Fantastic class, One Vision's easily the most powerful they've ever been, but they're very handy to have. So, uh, you have a good one. I will see you in the next part, and let me know if there's one you want to see. Take care.